Okay, uh, you can see, yeah. Uh, all right. So this is not my this is not my video. Somebody's video. Okay, just watch this. The French scientist Blaise Pascal said that pressure applied to an enclosed liquid is transmitted equally to every part of the liquid. So when you apply pressure at any one point in an enclosed liquid, it spreads equally in all directions. Let's see if this is true. For this, we need a tube with a piston at one end and a round bulb at the other. Observe the holes that are made on the round bulb placed in different directions. Now fill the tube with water and press the piston. Observe how the water spurts out. Is there any difference in the water pressure in any of the holes? No. You will see that water comes out of all the holes with equal pressure. And this is exactly what Blaise Pascal said. The pressure which we applied to the upper part of a column of enclosed water with a piston was transmitted in all directions equally. So we have just proved Pascal's law. Pascal's principle is widely used to make hydraulic brakes or other hydraulic devices like pumps. Have you seen the huge water towers built to help water distribution before pumps were invented? Do you know how they work? Okay. Okay, so uh, why I showed you that video, if you really want that link, I can share the link in uh, GC2 if you want to watch it again. Uh, but the reason why I wanted you to watch that is so that you can see Pascal's piston um, being, you know, like like in a video. Because we don't have Pascal's piston in uh, the school lab. I, I looked, don't have. So if you look at your textbook, if, you, if you're referring to your textbook, you can open to page something. Crap, I don't know what page number. I don't, I don't have the textbook with me. Uh, page 60. Page 60. If you have your textbook with you, open to page 60. 60. Page 60. Okay. Um, you'll see in activity 2.6 that Pascal's piston and pas uh, plastic basin, right? We don't have that in the school lab. So that's why I'm showing you a video instead. Uh, it's not very exciting, I know. It's like, okay, yeah, so what? Uh, but this demonstrates Pascal's principle. So as uh, the, the lecturer said in that video just now, Pascal's principle, Pascal's principle states that pressure applied on an enclosed fluid is transmitted uniformly in all directions in the fluid. So I took this definition from your textbook. This is the official definition that you use if you were asked to define Pascal's principle. Okay, so you can follow this from your textbook. You don't have to write exactly you're like, oh my god, teacher, the line set is so long, oh my god, how do you remember all of it, right? The so let's try to understand first, like what, what is he saying here? So here, Pascal's principle states that the pressure applied okay, in an on an enclosed fluid is transmitted uniformly in all directions in the fluid. So what does this mean? So in the case of the Pas uh, Pascal's piston just now, what, what that, pa that uh, Pascal's piston right, was showing us is proof that uh, pressure transmitted uniformly in a fluid it, uh, is, uh, we call it is transmitted uniformly in all directions. So in the piston, There's like a strange kind of thing here. So that means it's it's like you can manipulate it up and down. You can you can uh you know push it up and down if you want, right? And then what happens is you know you can you see that lecture just now he filled it full of water. Now inside this piston, uh of course there's holes actually. Oh sorry, his is not like that. His was just like holes around the base. But honestly, actually, right, if you have a piston where the holes are in all directions like this, when you push when you fill it up full of water and then you, you press the piston down, you'll find that the water will spurt out equally in all directions. And this is proof of Pascal's principle. That means what happens is when you press the piston, you exert a force on the liquid. This force is converted to pressure. So when you exert a pressure onto the liquid, you know what's fluid, by the way? I forgot to check with you guys. You know what's a fluid or not? What's a fluid? I must check with you guys first before I explain. What's a fluid? Upper car it too fluid. You know what's a fluid? I mean like 
A liquid or gas? Ah, you did learn before. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So in this case, right, uh, we're going to focus on a liquid. Uh, because in gases, right, somehow uh, it, it actually doesn't work so well because when we apply pressure on a gas, you compress the gas instead. Um, it works best with a liquid. So I'm going to focus on the liquid in this case uh, of water, right? So what happens is when we apply pressure on the liquid, uh, in this case water, lah, you apply pressure on the water, right? This pressure is transferred uniformly throughout the liquid. That means uh, even on these walls here, there's actually pressure being transmitted throughout the liquid. But because there's only holes at certain positions, ma, so where there's a hole, the water will come out. Lah. And because the pressure is transferred uniformly, that's why you find that the water will spread out with equal pressure. Now, this uh, Ms. Is sorry, Miss Hu, yeah. the pressure at the bottom of the of the flask, right? It will still be higher than the pressure at the top hole, right? Because it's like ah, so this is what I mean. That's this is what the thing uh, I need to address. Uh, it's a very common question. It's actually not. So here's the difference. Here's the difference. This one, right? Uh, is not the same as what we've been learning before in two point one. So if you um. Remember, uh, the one of the things, I think I showed you a video, my video lah, huh? but never mind, uh, I'm sure you've seen before. If let's say you have the container of water, where the hole is, you know, like we put a hole at the same level. Did I show you this video? I think I did, right? Where I, I punched a hole in the water bottle and I poured water. So we had, um, if you put, Holes at different levels, we already know that the water will spread at uh, different different distances, correct? But the one where the level is the same, they will spread with equal distance, correct? You remember this one? So let's forget this because this is not the, the one that I want to focus on. We talk about the same level. Now, this is 2.1, where same level, same liquid, same pressure. But... What we're learning now is different. Uh, it looks the same, but why is it different? Because this is static pressure. Static pressure meaning uh, we don't apply anything. You fill up the water inside, you leave it. The water exerts a pressure. The water exerts a pressure due to its depth, its density, and the gravitational acceleration, H4G. However, for Pascal's principle, this one is dynamic pressure. Okay. Sorry, I tekan the button. Dynamic pressure. That means this is now not due to water. This pressure is now pressure that we exert onto the liquid. That pressure we exert, external pressure. Huh? So you think of it as uh, external pressure also. Okay, you can think of it this way. This is um, internal pressure. This one is external pressure. Nothing to do with HROG. So when we exert an external pressure, that pressure is transferred. It's dynamic because it's being transferred. That pressure, this pressure, this dynamic pressure is transferred uniformly throughout the liquid. So whether it's at the top or at the bottom, the dynamic pressure is the same. It's not different. They're the same. Does that make sense? So it uh it does uh let me like we'll do we have to do some questions to be able to tell the difference between uh, static or dynamic, but usually it's quite quite clear lah because um later when you do the when you see the questions you you you'll see what I mean. <laughs> so it's very easy to understand. But the but we, but in this case we're gonna focus on this lah. So this one is under topic two point one. Okay, this is under P equals H G. Topic 2.1. So we're going to focus on dynamic pressure now where we exert an external pressure onto the liquid. But normally the questions you come across are not based on uh, Pascal's piston. So I'm going to go to slide number two now. If you're on the jam board with me, uh, come to slide number two. Okay. Um, the kind of questions that you normally see will be um, for hydraulic systems. So super simple hydraulic system is like the one in your textbook, which is... Wait, Page. Uh, page 61 is, we have this device, but it doesn't work in a lab. 
<laughs> it's broken. I saw it, the lamp was broken. Uh, but we'll see like, if it works then when you come back. I'll, I'll try to show to you. I want you to go to page 62 instead. Page 62. So this is a, a, a simple diagram to show us Pascal's principle uh, being applied in an everyday application. So I want you to imagine now, uh, instead of the single piston with the round, right, you know, round um, base like that instead. So okay, I want you to imagine right this this piston. This is a system where um it's it's one like like one big um like hose, but we call it a piston lah. Okay, why a piston? Because on one side, and not one side, on both sides. Uh, these are pistons that can, can move. So like in your, you look in your page 62, like your, your textbook, right? So you've got uh, two pistons that are connected via a pipe system. One, one piston is smaller than the other. So this system has to be full of liquid. I'm not going to say fluid. I, I can show you why it doesn't work so well with uh, air later. I'll send you a video now, now no time. If you want to watch, you don't watch, never mind. So what happens is uh, you've got a smaller piston and a larger piston. Okay. Now, normally in this kind of system, this is a hydraulic system. H hydraulic meaning hydraulic is like fluids, right? Uh, liquids. So we fill this completely full of uh, liquid. Normally not water. We normally use hydraulic fluid like oil. Okay. Uh, I'll explain why in, in a moment. But what we have here is, let's say, right, we apply a force. So remember, we are we are exerting an external pressure. So we apply a force this way. So this force can be like we apply, or could be a machine that applies the force. What happens is this force is converted to pressure. So then this becomes pressure. Okay. Now um, remember the formula that you've learned uh, ages ago. Not 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 in form five. Pressure is force over area. Press force over area. So, of course, smaller area, higher pressure. That was, that was what you've learned last time, right? Then I might just focus first, concept of pressure here. So, when you apply a force, it's converted to pressure. Is that you guys? That me? Nope. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> hey, where's, where's the meat? I lost you. Okay, so what happens is this pressure is then transferred uniformly throughout the system. That's enclosed. That means there's no holes this time, right? It's enclosed, just like uh, that one. But if there's any holes, of course, the water will spurt out. Lah. Okay, here, there's no holes. So what happens is the pressure is transferred. I'm just drawing arrows here, okay? Just to help you imagine, all right, that it's uh, being transferred uh, uniformly. So, but here, there's another piston. And this piston can move. So because it can move, when pressure is exerted on this piston, this piston will end up moving. Now, let's say this is uh, pressure 1 and pressure 2. Because pressure is transferred uniformly, that means the P1 here is equal to P2. Now, here the area is larger and it's not by accident. There is a reason. We know that pressure is force over area. Based on this, if P1 is equal to P2, let's say the area here is area 1, this is F1, Area 2, F2. So that means, right, F1 over A1 is equal to F2 over A2. We already know the pressure is the same. So if the area here is larger, you can see A2 is much bigger. That means if A2, let me change color. If area 2 is much larger, now there's no force being exerted here. In fact, what happens is that it generates a force. That means this pressure will generate a force. Uh, so what happens is the pressure cre generates a force. So you can think of it like this is MV, this is RV, no? cause effect. So what happens is this generates a force because of pressure, right? Pressure now is applied onto the area. This generates a force. This force is F2. Because the area is so much bigger, F2 also becomes so much bigger. Can follow so far? Okay. So when you exert a force on the on one piston, it is converted to pressure. This pressure is transferred uniformly throughout the system. The resulting pressure produces a force on the other piston. And because the area is larger, 
the force also becomes larger because it's the pressure that is the same. So when the force becomes larger, this kind of system where this is the input and this is the output, oops, this system is known as a force magnifier because you apply a small amount of force here, it is able to create a large force over here. So hydraulic systems hydraulic when you see the word hydraulic right it is based on pascal's principle sometimes it's known as hydraulic principle uh, i think in igcse is written as hydraulic principle uh, spm we call it we, we use a person's name pascal's principle so uh all hydraulic systems use this concept that where a small force can create a large force so where is this used this is used in hydraulic lifts to lift up heavy objects it's used in hydraulic jacks, like the one that, you know, in cars, when you, when you want to change a tire, you put the thing under, you nee, 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 and then the tire, nee, 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 then the tire will change tire, right? I think uh, all of you have seen before, I'm sure. <laughs> if any of you uh, ever had the unfortunate, uh, we had a misfortune of having uh, a blown tire, I had before a few times, I had to get <laughs> that thing, push up. Yeah, so that's a hydraulic jack. So like, how come that small thing can lift up one end of the car? because it uses a hydraulic uh, concept. Uh, hydraulic brakes also, like in cars, when you press on the brake, right? Actually inside there is a, this is a whole series of uh, pipes and all that, which is connected to the, the tires, uh, not tires actually, it's connected to the, the axle and all that, right? So it, it actually, uh, the, the car system, when you step, the hydraulic liquid inside creates a force large enough to be able to stop the wheels from moving. And for lorries, they don't use hydraulic either. They use uh, air, I think. They use air brakes. They don't use uh, liquids because it is not enough to stop the whole vehicle from... Uh, it's not enough to make the vehicle come to a stop in time. If the area of the output piston increases drastically, does it affect the force needed input piston? No. Because it. what happens is... Wait, uh, where's my jam board? So what happens is um, when we exert a force on the smaller piston, right, that creates a pressure, whatever happens here, this is the effect, cause and effect. What we create at the cause will make the effect change. Whatever happens to the effect area doesn't affect the cause. Does that make sense? So, so basically, like, if like the area is like really, really large, and this is a really small area at the output piston, the, the force that you need to push it up is still the same for both. Sorry, I, I'm not sure I understand the question. Could you... Uh... If, okay, it's, if your output area is small and you have a large output area, so you have a large output and you have a small output area, so the force that you need to push both of those output pistons up is the same. You mean if you have a small output versus uh, and a large output, is it? Uh, yeah, if your area is, yeah, if your area is large and small. Okay, so well, what happens is when you uh, you apply a certain force in the input, uh, that creates a pressure, right? But the output, the output area affects the output force. So if you have a smaller area, let's say if you have two systems, um, if you're on Jamboard with me, come to slide number three. If you have a smaller area versus a larger area, Let's say in this case, right, the input is the same. Let's say lah, this A1, A1 is the same, okay? A1 is the same, let's say. Um, so let's say A1, I'll just put numbers here so it's easier to visualize, say 10 cm squared. Let's say A2 is uh, 20 cm squared. Let's say A3 is 100 cm squared. Right. Let's say we apply the same amount of uh, force over here. Say F1 is um, 10 Newton. Hey, why are you CM? <laughs> Never mind. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to change the SI unit because I'm very lazy. <laughs> okay. uh, let's say right, pre the pressure applied then is F1 over A1, uh, 10 Newton over 10 CM squared. That gives us 1 Newton per CM squared. I'm just going to clean this up. 
So if let's say you do have a smaller area, like A2 is uh, less than A3, the output force will be different, which means that if you calculate, let's say you want to count the resultant F2. Let's say you want to count how much. So using this formula, F2 over A2, you would have 1 Newton per cm squared equals to F2 over 20 cm squared. F2 becomes 20 Newton. If you count for A3, P equals to F3 over A3, same pressure being transmitted because same F1, same A1, okay? So you get 1 Newton per cm squared equals to unknown F3 where the resultant force here is F3. You're counting F3 over um, A3, which is 100 cm squared, you would get F3 as 100 Newton. Does this, is this what you're asking? Oh, okay, I get it, I get it. Yeah. So if you don't change the force and area um, of the input, that pressure is fixed. But the result, the resulting force, right, how much force is being exerted on the output depends on the area. So if you want to be able to support greater weight, like let's say you have a hype the car, right? Like even in, if you've been to car workshops and all that, where you know they, they want to lift up cars and all that, right? That system, that also is a hydraulic system. You want to be able to support greater weight, then you have to make sure that the area is much larger. Multiplying factor. I think they only focus on multi force multiplier now. Um, okay, any other question? Okay. Um, are, are you okay if I teach you some additional information that's not in your textbook? Okay. Um, because there's some additional stuff that is also related to this hydraulic system, um, but, but it's not in your textbook. And even, to be honest, right, even in um, the older syllabus, it's not in your textbook, but suddenly it came up before in questions. So that's why I just want to... Um, Cover all bases, lah. Okay. Um, cover slide number four. If you're on a jam board with me, so if you have a uh, hydraulic system like this, and no, and normally how you can tell whether it's a Pascal's principle question is they will give you a diagram like this, lah. Then you see, oh, full of liquid. Okay. Oh, I'm supposed to also I tell you why it's not water, why we don't use water. I must remember to tell you that. Okay. So why uh, we don't use water is because um the liquid you use inside um, normally is a hydraulic fluid. I'll just write liquid here. Um, and I'll write short form. I'll just write a couple of things here, okay? So the liquid you use, right, um, the characteristics of the liquid must be incompressible and no air bubbles. Now, water gets air bubbles very easily, right? Like if you get a water bottle, and you just shake, you already can get water, uh, you know, you can already get air bubbles. And that's very important because water is, you know, like you have a lot of uh, life that grows in water, ma, um, the fish, la, the aquatic plants, la, and all that. You need oxygen to dissolve easily in water. But for this particular system, you don't want air bubbles, you don't want it to be compressible. Why? Because when you exert a force onto the liquid, we already know that the force is converted to pressure. Okay, it's converted to pressure. Uh, why is it not appearing? So what happens is if, if there were any air bubbles inside, okay, like not so big. Smaller. Smaller, okay, that's a smaller size. If there were air bubbles inside, I want you to imagine, right, you exert the force, the pressure is uh, being transferred. Okay, remember, uh, the pressure is transferred uniformly against the walls of the container and all that. Now, suddenly you go, ooh, air bubble. Now, is air compressible? Think about it, huh? If you trap some air inside a, a syringe or a piston and you press, can compress or not? Yes, which means, can, exactly, which means 
that as you're exerting the force on the system here, the pressure, some of the pressure will be used to compress the air bubble instead. So the pressure, instead of being transferred to the other side, it will bleed the system. Yeah. You'll find that, yeah, the pressure, right, uh, is, some of the pressure is lost. So it's like, it's a, it almost as if like you have a hole in here, the liquid's coming out, lah, you know, but except there's no hole, the air pressure is being used to compress the air instead. So that's why you'll find, so pressure is, um, not to say not uniform, but some of the pressure is used up to compress the air instead of being transferred to the other side. So okay, like it reduces the uniformity, you can think of it that way. Does that make sense? So that's why um, for hydraulic systems, right, the moment you have air bubbles inside, it actually, it doesn't work anymore. Suddenly it's like, oh, uh, you, you use, uh, it, 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 ca it cannot work. Or oh, it works also, right? It's like, like work a little bit then, but not effective. Like, ah, what happened? So that's why you must not have air bubbles inside. And water, where you get air bubbles, what? Secondly, water evaporates easily. If there's water inside, let's say if it's not watertight, water evaporates, it leaves an air pocket inside. And then the air, if let's say there's any air inside, let's say imagine the water level here, there's air inside, same thing. You apply, right, pressure is being transferred uh, to compress the air instead of being transferred throughout the liquid. So that's why I say that even though the, the Pascal's principle writes fluid, you try to use air inside the, the system, right, it actually doesn't work. Uh, I've tried. Okay, I've tried. Okay, also incompressible, you don't want the liquid to be compressible because if the liquid can be compressed like a sponge, then compress, la, then the pressure not being transferred to the other side. So no uniformity as well. Does that make sense? Okay, so these are the characteristics of the liquid that is normally used in a hydraulic system. If you are ever asked to describe or to state what the characteristics are, um, the, number one, you have to mention incompressible. Secondly, no air bubbles. Thirdly, you can say does not evaporate easily. And uh, in this order, actually. You, that means uh, you must mention, first of all, incompressible. The preferred one is always the first one, incompressible. Number two, number three is like, if they ask you for more. But your number one, anytime they ask you what, let's say they only ask you one characteristic of the liquid in a hydraulic system, you have to put incompressible. This is the main one. So like when uh, the liquid is incompressible, like it builds up the pressure in the hydraulic system, is it? Not builds up. It transfers the pressure. Um, okay. Yeah. So what would be an ideal type of liquid? Um, oil is one. You, yeah, you can use oil. Um, like the one that they use uh, in, in the, sh the workshops and all that, they put in the hydraulic brakes. They call it hydraulic, they call it brake fluid, la, but it's actually a type of oil. Because oil is not compressible, oil does not have air bubbles, and oil doesn't evaporate easily. Uh, we don't use mercury, yeah. <laughs> in case you're wondering, mercury is okay, ma. We, we don't use mercury. Although it can, mercury is too heavy because the density is very high, so it's actually not good. <laughs> So oil is one of the better ones. Okay. Any other question? Okay. If not, um, some a, li a little bit more um, information that I need to share with you. Come to slide number five if you're on a jam board with me. Sorry, you got to bear with more of Miss Ho's drawing. Sometimes the question we ask you, if let's say, right, the distance, they will tell you, okay, we push the piston down, we push the, 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 the input piston down to, let's say, a distance of 20 cm, they'll ask you, then this piston goes up, how much is the distance? They may ask you this. It's not in your textbook, it's not in your textbook, but they may ask you this. That means this original, we push down so that it, it, it comes up to 20 cm. So how to find out? I want you to think logically. If we push 20 cm, do you think this will go out 20 cm or you think it will be a different number? Different, exactly. So then the question, of course, becomes, uh, my gosh, how do we calculate, right? So 
this is not Pascal's principle. It's just that it's related to Pascal's principle. It's related to the system. How you calculate, like, it's like oh, how to count the distance. There are two ways. Two ways. One way is to count based on volume. Another way is to count based on work done. Volume. What do you mean by volume? Logically, if you push down a piston, you are displacing the liquid a certain volume, right? And remember, it's incompressible, ma. So how much liquid you push down, that's how much liquid that will be transferred to the other side, correct? Because you cannot compress. So how you count volume is, based on the, the concept here, you have, let's say, like, question gives you area one, area two. The volume that you calculate for a piston, if it's a cylinder, the volume is calculated as the area times the distance traveled. So that means if this is D1, which is 20 cm, area, wait, let me write this way. The volume transferred on this side is equal to the volume that's transferred to the other side. So if area times distance is the volume, that means A1, D1 equals to A2, D2. You can calculate like this. You can also use work done because there's a certain force exerted, right? Now, we already know F1, A1. We already know this la, the, from the Pascal's formula. F1 over A1 equals F2 over A2, right? So work done is what? Work done is force times uh, displacement. I'll just put it as D la, as the distance tra tra travel, okay? Which means that how much work you apply here, because work is energy, ma, how much work you apply on one side will be equal to the work transferred to the other side. As a result, F1, D1 equals to F2, D2. Uh, do these formulas make sense? Whether you use volume method or work method, you will get the same answer for both. I'll, I'll, I can show you. Uh, let's let me use let me speak the numbers from there just now. Ten newton and twenty. Okay. Let's say for example, uh, this area is uh, ten cm squared. Force is ten newton. Let's say the area here is uh, let's use the twenty cm squared. So when you wanna when you get the force, you should get twenty newton because ten newton over ten cm squared equals F two unknown twenty cm squared. F two you will get twenty newton. That means the force resulting force here is twenty newton. So if you try to use this method, that means you would get uh. A1, which is 10 cm squared times uh, 20 cm distance traveled, equals to 20 times D2, you will get D2 as 10 cm. If you try to use the work from I'm sorry, I'm going very fast here because time is running out. Uh, F1, let's say, is 10 newton times D is 20 cm. F2 is 20 unknown D2. You count count A, you still get the same answer. So whether you use volume or work, you'll get the same answer. One thing, can I just point out to you also, is that interestingly, right, because um, because the area here is so much bigger for the larger piston, the output piston, when you exert a force um, to and move, you move the piston on the input side, right, although the force is larger on the output side, you can see the distance that the piston moves is much smaller. So you do support greater force on the output, but the piston will move a smaller distance. Just to point out to you. Do you know what I mean? Like the input piston moved 20 cm, the output piston only moved 10 cm. The distance is less because the area is larger. And even though the force is larger, it the piston moves a smaller distance. Just to point out to you. Um the, can you understand what I mean? Why I'm mentioning this, it's not in your syllabus. But remember that uh, earlier I mentioned the word force magnifier. That's in your textbook, by the way. Um, when the output piston is larger, right? This becomes a force magnifier because the distance Sorry, distance block, the force becomes much, much bigger, right? Like from 10 Newton, it, ah, can I see the 10? The 10 Newton has become 20 Newton. Like the factor now is by two. 
it's not in your syllabus. There's something else which is the opposite, known as a distance magnifier. Distance magnifier. I'm going to go to slide number six. Slide number six. Miss Ho, but I don't understand why the distance decreases though. Because the the area is larger, ma. If the volume displaced is the same, you think about it. It's a smaller smaller area here, smaller dis uh, so that the, the distance covered here is the volume, right? Then when the volume is transferred to the other side, here the volume is the same, but the area is so much larger. So the like the liquid gets spread out. That's why the distance move is smaller. Oh, so the liquid is still in com like the distance like i mean the volume like travel is still the same but it's just that it's like you know pressed out like what you said yeah that's why the distance is less okay okay thank you okay anyone else okay okay um so extra information not in your textbook but i think as physics students uh, you should be aware of this as well i'm going to slide number six if you do the opposite if, let's say, you go the opposite, that means, uh, now, so far, I've been talking about output piston um, is the larger one, input piston is the smaller one. And that's the focus for SPM, by the way. Yeah? The input is smaller, output is larger. What if we reverse it? What if? In output. See, I, would keep, I see the big one, I keep thinking output because I'm so used to doing that in my classes. If the input now is a larger one and output is a smaller one, very unusual, but possible. Same concept, all the... Okay. If you do this, then uh, you'll feel like, eh, like wasting your effort because you have to exert so much force and the resulting force is very small. That's what will happen. Because let's say, example, I'll give you some numbers so that you can visualize, okay? Let's say this area is uh, now, say, We'll do the same numbers, huh? 20 cm squared. Let's say F1 is 20 newton. So we now exert in the input piston, which is much larger, 20 newton force on a larger area of 20 cm squared. Let's say this F2 is, uh, sorry, this A2 is smaller. Say it's uh, only 10 cm squared. So if you wanted to calculate F2, if you want to calculate F2, you'll have to do this. F1 over A1 equals F2 over A2. You'll have 20 over 20 equals to F2 over 10. F2 now becomes only 10 newton. So you exert so much force, but because pressure is transferred uniformly, wow, the force comes out smaller. Like, oh my God, waste my effort. It becomes smaller. So why on earth would anyone do this? Because this is a distance magnifier. You use this if you need to move this a greater distance. So based on just now, what we've just learned, let's say we take the volume method, all right? Let's say this one now we move um, 20 cm, let's say. So that means A1, D1 equals A2, D2, where this is D1. D2 will be the distance move. Lah. So if you count this, you get 20 times 20 equals to 10 times D2, you will get 40 cm. So suddenly you see, A, the distance becomes double. Even though the force is less, or rather because the force is less, the distance is now double. Even if you try to use the work method, you get the same answer. Okay, let's say you calculate work, F1, D1 equals F2, D2. So that means the force we apply over a larger uh, distance, because now it's a smaller area, so the, 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 the uh, work is now concentrated on a smaller area. So even though smaller force, but you count, 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 you actually end up getting 40 cm. So we only use this method if we really need the distance to be increased and the force can be small, just to let you know, so that you are aware that this exists. But for SPM, this almost never comes out. Let me rephrase. This never comes out. I have not seen this come out before in SPM. But I'm teaching this because I've seen this come out in IGCSE. Um, so why I'm covering this is because, look, we don't know what's coming out for SPM, right? Um, some things are pinjam, they pinjam from IGCSE. So I've seen this in IGCSE, but uh, SPM, it hasn't come up. But I'll just, I'm just showing you so at least you are aware. 
focus more on um, the smaller input piston, larger output piston. That means slides one to five. Okay, slide six is extra information. So I'm going to write here, this is extra information. So uh, with this, actually, we have concluded um, learning Pascal's principle, the theory part. You definitely need to do um, questions.